Um, I'm very excited to announce um, and introduce Carl Zha, who's a Chinese American independent political analyst, analyst uh, excuse me, and he is the creator and host of the podcast called Silk and Steel about China, the Silk Road, history, culture, and geopolitics. You can find Carl and Silk and Steel podcast on Twitter, YouTube, and Patreon. And we'll be linking to his podcast, Silk and Steel's uh, recent series on the history of Taiwan. It's a very long and comprehensive series. So if you don't feel like we got deep enough into that tonight, it's a, it's a great place to go after this to seek more information so you can find out uh, what your views are after having all the facts in front of you. Um, that series is also with Shang Yu and um, just want to acknowledge that Shang Yu is Taiwanese so uh, you can get into some opinions from uh, someone who has you know, deep ties to the region of Taiwan. Um, so thank you so much for being here today, Carl, with Code Pink and Mass Peace Action. And uh, Carl's going to present for a little bit, and then afterwards, um, we will go into some further questions. So if you have um, a specific question for Carl, um, I may, we may have time for it. I'm going to be asking questions first, and we'll see if we have time. Um, feel free to ask those, though, and engage in the chat. Thanks, Carl. Thank you, Madison, and thank you for the organizer of CoPink for inviting me to speak. Um, I will share my screen now. I, I did prepare a, a slide for this. Um, if every, can everybody see my screen? So this yeah. is, uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna first gonna present a brief history of Taiwan, just to provide the historical context. Uh, hopefully with more nuance than the John Oliver piece. Uh, I have 60 slides, so I will go very quickly. Uh, so first location of Taiwan, Taiwan is located about a mile a uh, hundred mile off the coast of mainland China, southwest of Okinawa, north of the Philippines. Uh, Taiwan has been inhabited since Paleolithic age and around 5,000 years ago, uh, Austronesian farmers from mainland China start to arrive. And this is a possible migration route from where foxtail, millet and rice cultivation happened in, first uh, happened in mainland China. These farmers made their way down the coast and they made it to Taiwan about 5,000 years ago. And from Taiwan, the Austronesian farmers brought their language and culture and spread it all throughout maritime Southeast Asia, as far as Polynesia, Hawaii, Eastern Island, New Zealand, and as far as Madagascar off the coast of Africa. Taiwan in historical records, uh, during the Three Kingdoms period of China, the Wu Kingdom sent the expedition to a large island called Yizhou. Then early seventh century, the Sui Dynasty sent the expedition to Liuqiu Island. Then in 1292, the Yuan Dynasty sent an expedition to Liuqiu Island. So traditional interpretation is that Yizhou, Liuqiu all refer to Taiwan, although there's some disagree and think it re actually refer to Okinawa. But by 9th century, the Han Chinese fishermen start to settle in Penghu Islands in the Taiwan Strait, very close to Taiwan. And then in, 18, in 1281, after the failed Mongol invasion of Japan, the Kublai Khan had his fleet setting up shop and uh, on the Penghu Island and officially set up administration. So from Yuan Dynasty, Penghu Island, this is a location of Penghu Islands. You can see it's very close to Taiwan already. Uh, from Yuan Dynasty, Penghu Islands was officially listed as part of China. Then uh, in 1620s, in the late Ming Dynasty, the Europeans start to show up. The Dutch wanted to forcibly open China for trade. So they, they start by occupying the Penghu archipelago, but the Ming sent a fleet to kick out the Dutch. So the Dutch had to fo was forced to flee to Taiwan and set up shop there. Uh, just another note that start from, uh, from, at least from Yuan dynasty, uh, Han Chinese fishermen start to uh, go across to Taiwan to fish around the waters around Taiwan. The Chinese uh, traders start to trade with indigenous people on Taiwan and the Han Chinese pirates start setting up their base on the Taiwan Island because it's outside the imperial control. When the Dutch came to Taiwan, they set up their uh, fort, fort at Fort Zealandia. And from there, they start to subjugate indigenous people uh, on Taiwan. And the Spanish didn't want to be left behind. So they, they set up their own colony in the northern Taiwan around you know, the present day Taipei area. But after 20 years, the Dutch 
uh, wage a war against the Spanish, kick them out. And by that time, by 1640s, Spanish uh, Dutch control almost all the coastal areas of Taiwan. But of course, that left the, the vast interior of Taiwan is still under the indigenous control. This is a painting of the Dutch for Zealandia on Taiwan. This is a, a it's, it's built on a sandbar called Taiwan. And Taiwan is from, a, from the indigenous, indigenous name given to the sandbar. But eventually the name Taiwan will expand to include the whole island. So uh, Taiwan is actually an indigen indigenous name as opposed to Formosa because Formosa was a, was a Portuguese name given to the island in the, 50, uh, in the 16th century. After the Dutch arrived, they set out to expand their colony. They, uh, because it was too expensive to bring European colonists to Taiwan, they settled on bring, uh, bring mass uh, migration of Han Chinese migrant farmer into Taiwan. This is an 18th century painting of a sugar plantation on Taiwan. Uh, in fact, the Dutch uh, famously said, Taiwan is a land of milk and honey and the Chinese are the worker bees. And in fact, the, the Dutch exploitation of these Chinese migrant labor was so, so hard, she sparked several rebellions uh, by the Chinese migrants on the island and the Dutch brutally put them down with, with multiple massacres until this man showed up. And this is Koshinga, AKA Zhen Chenggong. He's a son of a, ja a Chinese pirate and, a ja and his Japanese wife. Uh, when his dad was still a roving pirate basing off of Japan. But then his dad uh, went back to China, surrendered to the Ming Dynasty and become a Ming general. So at age of eight, Zhen Chenggong went to China to receive a proper Confucian education. And then the Ming Dynasty collapsed. So in 1640s, the, uh, the Manchus breached the Great Wall and start conquering all of China. Uh, Zhen Chenggong's father, a uh, 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 Ming commander, defected to the Qing government, but Zhen Chenggong decided to remain loyal to the Ming cause. And from his base along the Chinese coast, he uh, launched his resistance against the Qing rule. At, at one point, he even sailed into the Yangtze River and almost took over the city of Nanjing. But eventually he was defeated and he realized he needed a base to uh, a secure base against the Qing. So he's cast his eyes at the Dutch colony of Taiwan where Dutch already brought over tens of thousands of Chinese uh, migrants. And so on, in 1661, Zhen Chenggong brought over 25,000 troops with him and besieged the Dutch in Taiwan. This is after a year of siege, the Dutch surrendered to Koxinga. This is a Dutch painting of their surrender on Taiwan to the Ming loyalist general Koxinga. This is a, a modern Chinese painting of Dutch surrender on Taiwan. Um, after, Kong, after taking over Taiwan, Zhen Chenggong wanted to move over to uh, move to the Philippines and kick the Spanish out of Manila, but he died that year. But before he died, he, he sent the order to execute one of his most capable generals, Silang. So Silang then escaped across the Taiwan Strait and surrendered to the Qing Dynasty. Uh, after Zhen Chenggong died, his son Zhen Jin ruled the island for about 20 years. But after 20 years, the defector general Silang had his revenge. He led, uh, he led the Qing force across the Taiwan Strait and conquered Taiwan for the Qing dynasty. And that happened in 1682. And that's about 100 years before the founding of the United States. This is a paint map of Taiwan in the, in the 19th century. So after the Qing dynasty took over, they expand, the Han settlement uh, expanded on Taiwan. And uh, as, and they most they mo they took over the fertile plains on the east coast of Taiwan. Um, so, uh, but the, the the on the on the eastern on the west coast of Taiwan, sorry, the east part of Taiwan, the mountainous part was still under the uh, under the control of the indigenous people. In fact, the, under the Qing government, the Qing Qing official pursue a segregationist policy because they don't want the mixing of the different ethnicities to cause ethnic conflict. And then they have to send in the military to put down rebellions. So on mainland China, that means the Han Chinese are forbidden to migrate into Mongolia, to Manchuria, to Southern Xinjiang, where the Uyghur Muslim live. And on Taiwan, the Han Chinese were forbidden to move into the indigenous people's territory. Um, 
And this this lasted until the end of Qing rule. There's a famous uh, line called Tu Liu Xian or Tu Liu Line that that Qing government put in uh, in place that that forbids the Han settlers from crossing. And then the Americans would show up in 1850s. Uh, this is a Commodore Perry leading his black ship to open uh, forcibly open Japan and also the Luchu Kingdom on Okinawa for trade. Uh, this is a Japanese woodblock painting of Perry. Um, and this is a Japanese woodblock painting of uh, Perry's black ship. Uh, Perry actually stopped by Taiwan on his second trip, and he realized Taiwan is a strategic importance as a midway transshipment point between the East Asian trade. So Perry uh, sent a, a note to the, <laughs> he suggested to the United States government that US should annex Taiwan. But his proposal was ignored uh, because US was busy with other things. A few years later, US would, be uh, in a very bloody civil war. But after the civil war, the Americans are back. Uh, so after 1860s, uh, the end of second opium war, China was forced to legalize opium trade and threw open all the coastal ports to foreign traders, including the ports on Taiwan. In 1867, American merchant ship Rover sailed from the port of Eastern Guangdong, uh, uh, Santo to Yinko in, in, in Manchuria, but on the way it got blown off the course and shipwrecked off the coast of Taiwan. The survivors who made ashore were promptly massacred by the indigenous people for trespassing. And then the American consul at Sham in China, uh, Charles Legendre, went to the Qing government demanding compensation and punishment for all the indigenous people. But the Qing official, being a uh, being typical bureaucrat, said, well, these, these people are savages. They're, they're beyond the pale of civilization. There's nothing I can do. So Americans took that excuse, excuse to, to take matter into their own hands. They sent in the Marines. Uh, US Marines landed on the island, but they were ambushed and defeated by the indigenous people on Taiwan. So the next point, the American consul in Sham and Charles Legendre went back to the Qing government. He went to the Fujian governor and he threatened that US will take military action against China if nothing was done. So he strong on the Qing governor to give him a battalion of Chinese soldiers. He went to Taiwan, he uh, went to this, this area. This is a, the most Southern tip of Taiwan, the pink area that was under indigenous <laughs> control. And he uh, forced the indigenous chief to sign a treaty to put up a lighthouse and to agree that uh, any Western sailors that come ashore waving a red flag as a sign of distress, um, indigenous people will pr promise not to massacre them. And to the east of uh, Taiwan is, uh, is a Luchu Island chain or the traditionally Luchu kingdom with capital on Okinawa. This Luchu kingdom has been the tributary state to China since Ming dynasty. But then the Satsuma clan of Japan subjugated Luchu kingdom because Japan was forbidden to trade with China directly. Uh, and by subjugating Luchu Kingdom, they found a backdoor way to trade with China. So essentially, uh, uh, Luchu Island became dual vassal of China and Japan for a long time. And but Japan, after 1860s uh, Meiji Restoration, the Japanese centralized its government, abolished feudal domains, and they wanted to annex Luchu Kingdom outright. And they found their excuse in 1871 when Luchu sailors who were uh, coming back from Okinawa after a trade mission to send the tribute to the Okinawa king, to the Luchu king, on the way back, they were blown off the course and, and, and shipwrecked all in Taiwan at the same place where the American ship Rover shipwrecked several years before. The, Qing, uh, uh, the survivors again were massacred by the indigenous people. A few survivors escaped. They ran to the uh, to the to the uh, Qing authorities on Taiwan, and the Qing authority fed them, closed them, and sent them back to to Luchu Islands. And they thought the matter was closed, but Japan didn't think so because Japan uh, demanded that Qing pay compensation on the reason that Lu Luchu Kingdom is now a protectorate under under Japan. The demand the Qing government pay compensation and also punish the indigenous people who, who did the massacring. Again, the Qing official said, these are just savages. They're beyond the pale of civilization. Nothing I can do. And then the Qing, uh, then the Japan used as excuse to, to launch its own invasion of Taiwan. This time, Japan was helped by 
the Americans who participated in the previous invasion of Taiwan, the the, the um, former American consul to Shaman, Charles Legendre, became advisor to the Japanese government. He plotted out, plotted and planned the whole Japanese invasion of Taiwan. James Roberts, uh, Robert Watson of U.S. Army, Douglas Castle of U.S. Navy, who participated in the previous U.S. Uh, expedition to Taiwan, became advisor to the Imperial Japanese Army. So this is a Japanese woodblock painting of the Imperial Japanese Army basically massacring the indigenous people on Taiwan. And the Qing government want, obviously didn't want Japanese troops on the island. So they asked the British to, uh, to, to mediate. And in the end, the Qing agreed to pay Japanese compensation and also to compensate Japan for the cost of their expedition. The British ambassador to Japan at the time said, China basically paid pay for the privilege of being invaded. But Japan got what it wanted. Uh, mostly it's uh, the implicit recognition by Qin that uh, Luchu Kingdom is indeed uh, under Japan protection. So, so Japan then moved to annex Luchu Kingdom on Okinawa. This is a picture of Japanese Imperial troops posted outside the Royal Palace, uh, 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 the Shurika Castle um, in Okinawa. And, and they, for, they turned the Luchu Kingdom on Okinawa into Okinawa Prefecture. And then in the, in the Sino-French War of 1884 and 1885, the French Navy attacked the Penhu Islands and they also landed troops on Taiwan. And that made the Qing government finally realize the strategic importance of Taiwan. So after the conclusion of Sino-French War in 1885, the Qing officially upgraded Taiwan from mere a prefecture of Fujian province to its own province. So Taiwan was made into a province in 1885, uh, but 10 years later, first Sino-Japanese war happened. This is a woodblock painting of the Japanese Imperial Navy sinking the Qing fleet in the Battle of Yellow Sea. Uh, as a result of China's defeat, Japan forced uh, Qing government to cede Taiwan to Japan. But that's not what the people on Taiwan want. They, don't, they want to be Chinese subject. They don't want to be Japanese subject. So they decided to declare independence. Uh, this is, they, de they declared the Formosa Republic. And this is a flag of the Formosa Republic, the, the tiger flag. Um, and the, the Qing governor on Taiwan became the first president of, of Formosa uh, Republic. And this is a newspaper at, uh, illustration published in Taiwan at the time, uh, illustrating the declaration of Formosa Republic. Their calendar year is named Yongqing which literally means forever Qing in Chinese, uh, which shows their loyalty to, to China. They just didn't want to be Japanese subjects. Uh, so Japan actually had to fight another war of conquest. They landed their army on Taiwan and fought a serious battles against uh, mostly local Hakka militias, but their power is overwhelming and they eventually took over Taiwan in 1895. And this is a painting of Japanese Imperial Army marching into the Straits of Taipei in 1895. Thus began the 50 year colonial rule of Japan on the island. Now the Japan didn't just uh, subjugate all the Han settlements to the, on the Western Taiwan. Japan also subjugated the indigenous people in the Eastern mountains. Um, in fact, that this led to a lot of resistance. It, it, most famously in 1930s, the Wusa incident when uh, the indigenous people rose against the Japanese colonial rule, but they were brutally put down. The Japanese Air Force dropped mustard gas on the indigenous communities. And uh, so eventually by 1930s, all of Taiwan Island had been subjugated by Japan. And Japan started the Japanization program, the so-called Kominka movement. Komin literally means emperor subject in Japanese. And to be a Komin, to be a loyal emperor subject, you have to give up your Chinese name, you have to adopt a Japanese name, and you have to perform a Shinto ceremony where you give up your, renounce your Chinese ancestor and adopt a fake Japanese ancestor. Now, um, keep in mind, out of the whole population of Taiwan, only 2% of the Taiwan population actually went through the whole process and became a full-fledged Komin. And these 2% are usually uh, match the the, the landed elite, the, the landlord class on Taiwan who collaborated with the Japanese. Among the Japanese collaborator family is that family of the former Taiwan leader, Li Denghui. His, um, his brother volunteered for the Japanese Imperial Navy and died in the Battle of Manila against Americans. 
and he himself volunteered for uh, to be an anti-aircraft gunner uh, for the Imperial Japanese Army on, uh, in Taiwan because by 1945, American um, Air Force started to bomb Japanese occupied Taiwan from uh, air base on mainland China. And, and everyone in on Taiwan also are forced to uh, you know, learn Japanese. Um, and this ended in 1945 after the Japanese surrender. This is the day when Japan was restored back to China according to the Cairo and um, post Dan declaration. The KMT uh, landed on Taiwan with, uh, with American support. Uh, the problem is that KMT government at this time, it was incredibly corrupt, which actually the civil war will break out soon on mainland China. Uh, when, uh, the KMT, when the KMT landed, most of, a lot of the assets on Taiwan are owned by the Japanese colonial authorities. So the KMT carpetbagger officials came in, they confiscated the Japanese colonial uh, properties, but they turned them into their own personal assets. And because of the civil war breaking out mainland China, KMT increased taxation, um, the inflation was rampant. And so this created a lot of discontent on the Taiwan Island itself. This all come ahead on February 28th, 1947. When a, ja when a KMT uh, tax collector beat up a 40 year old woman for selling unlicensed cigarettes. And when the crowd protested, the KMT sh shoot into the crowd. And this sparked uh, a general uprising on the um, island against the KMT rule. This, this famous painting was painted by a left wing artist from, um, from my hometown of Chongqing on mainland China. And for this painting, he was arrested and executed in 1951 for spreading pro-communist propaganda. And this is a picture of the riot that ensued. Um, uh, there was a general uprising on the island. Then the founder of the Taiwan Communist Party, Xie Xue Hong, led the only ar organized armed resistance against the uh, KMT. She actually formed a, a, a guerrilla uh, against, uh, against the KMT, but the KMT shipped troops from mainland and eventually the uprising was crushed and Xie Xue Hong had to flee to mainland China. This begins the, uh, what's known as a white terror era in Taiwan. So anyone can be accused of being a, a communist sympathizer and be jailed and executed. This is a picture of two women who work at the Taiwan post office. They were, uh, they were accused on the Trump up charges of being communist spy. And one woman, uh, Ding Yao Tao, he, she was already pregnant at the time of her arrest. So her daughter was born and raised in prison. And two years later, both of these women were executed. And this was the environment in Taiwan at the time. And this was all fully supported by the United States, uh, especially after the outbreak of Korean War. This is a picture of US Army officers training and equipping the, the KMT military on Taiwan. Um, and of course, uh, after 1949, KMT was fully defeated on Taiwan and most and all the KMT troops came, uh, the KMT was fully defeated on mainland China and all the KMT troops now pulling to Taiwan with support of the Americans. And US 7th fleet, uh, President Truman authorized 7th fleet to sail into the Taiwan Strait to prevent the uh, Chinese People's Liberation Army from crossing the Taiwan Strait, from liberating the Taiwan Island. Uh, this is June 1950, so it's four, it's four months before the Chinese involvement in the Korean War, and this already happened. This is uh, General Mac uh, 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 MacArthur on Taiwan on August 1950. This is Chiang Kai-shek in the background, the leader of KMT. Uh, oh, here's uh, Vice President Richard Nixon presenting a picture of President Eisenhower to, uh, to Chiang Kai-shek on Taiwan in 19... Uh, in 1950s. And also during the Korean War, the um, US set up the so-called Air Defense Identification Zones, short ADIAs, ADIZ, for Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. Now, 
ADIZ has no basis in international law. It's unilaterally declared and includes a lot of the international airspace because uh, uh, each country's sovereign airspace is only limited to 12 nautical miles off its coast. And, but the American declare ADIA zone include a lot of international airspace. And look at the ADIA in Korea, it, it stretch it over North, North Korea and almost go up to Pyongyang. And then there's a famous Taiwan ADIA zone. You can see half of it is over mainland China. And uh, it, the, the, the recent news you hear about Chinese uh, incursion into the Taiwan airspace. This is what they're talking about. They're talking about Chinese aircraft flying over this American declared ADIA zone. Um, and I will talk about that later. And US also placed 12 Matador nuclear capable missile in Taiwan in 1957 and later deployed a nuclear weapon on Taiwan aim at mainland China. And in 1958, during the Kim, uh, Taiwan Strait crisis, when uh, it looks like the uh, China, it looks like PRC was poised to take over these offshore islands that's still controlled by the KMT. Uh, US military suggested to use nuclear weapon against mainland China because they, they realized there's no way to stop a conventional takeover of these islands. So they, they recommended uh, using nuclear weapon against the airfields on China. If that, that doesn't stop, uh, that, if that doesn't stop the PRC, they recommended to launch nuclear weapon deep into mainland China. And they also realized, this is revealed in, the, in a recent uh, Daniel Ellsberg leak. Um, they also realized there's a possibility that Soviet Union might do a, a retaliation by striking Taiwan and Okinawa with nuclear weapons. But American planners decided that's a price they're willing to take. They're willing to save Taiwan, even if that means that Taiwan gets nuked. They're okay with that. Um, Oh, look, it's the President Eisenhower visiting Taiwan with Chiang Kai-shek in 1960. Uh, American troop level in Taiwan rose to 30,000 during the Vietnam War. Uh, now, this is an infamous Time Magazine Christmas in Vietnam special uh, on the US, US military R&R, AK sex tourism in, in East Asia from the issue of December 22nd, 1967, future in Taiwan. So, uh, during the Japanese colonial rule on Taiwan, uh, the Imperial Japanese Army set up these women attended baths in Taiwan to serve the Japanese. But after the Imperial Japanese Army left, the KMT repurposed this uh, es establishment to serve the American GIs. Um, so, you know, it was openly taught in the page of Time magazine. You can find it in the Time Vault. Um, and this is a kind of the state of Taiwan was in. Now the KMT misrule actually led to the sparse independence movement because KMT precluded unification with mainland China with the help of US, showed off of the communist and leftist opposition. Uh, joining Red China is no longer an option. The opposition to KMT then turned, turned toward advocating Taiwan independence because KMT is a Chinese nationalist party that insisted on its rights to rule all of China, including Taiwan. And Ch KMT mismanagement uh, of the inter-ethnic relations. Most people on pre-1945 Taiwan, uh, I'm talking about the most Han Chinese people, originally came from the Fujian province uh, across the strait, and they mostly speak Minnan language. The newcomers that came with KMT with a retreat from mainland, they came from all over China and speak different languages. And the KMT depended on the, the military that it brought over from mainland China for control. And by for the fair, but because KMT control uh, every aspect of Taiwan society, and because KMT is a, essentially a mainland mainlander par party, so mainlanders occupy most of the leadership positions. And KMT also started to force uh, to impose standard Mandarin language on Taiwan. Now. Um, anybody who caught speaking standard Mandarin in, in Taiwan schools were, were beaten. Okay, I, I, I grew up in 1980s China in, in Chongqing. Uh, at the time we are required, we speak standard Mandarin in class, but during the recession, we speak our own, own dialect, nobody bothered us. But in Taiwan, it was different. In, in Taiwan, this was very, very coerced uh, language program. So this, this all led to the resentment of so-called Bensenden or the Taiwan provincials against the KMT rule. 
Uh, now, come 1971, uh, United Nations ha- hold a vote. So up to 1971, Chiang Kai-shek regime on Taiwan presented itself as sole legitimate ruler of all of China. But in 1971, uh, majority of the countries in U- United Nations voted in the People's Republic of China and voted out Chiang Kai-shek's regime from the United Nations Security Council. And the following year, uh, Nixon visited China and that's when U.S. issues a joint Shanghai communique, which states the United States acknowledged that all Chinese on either side of Taiwan Strait maintain there's but one China and that Taiwan is a part of China. The United States government does not challenge this position, re- reaffirms the interest of the peaceful settlement of Taiwan question by the Chinese themselves. So this is important because uh, back when it was issued, most of the people on Taiwan still identify as Chinese, right? So it says all Chinese on the either side of Taiwan Strait. Um, in response, as the U.S. normalized its ties with China, U.S. Congress put forth the Taiwan Relation Act because, uh, you know, for a long time, U.S. Congress had this so-called Thai China lobby which backed the Chiang Kai-shek regime, including the owner of Time Life uh, Media Empire, Henry Luce. Um, so they, 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 these congressmen put up the Taiwan Relation Act, which the uh, US is uh, supposed to assess Taiwan, assist Taiwan in maintaining its self-defense capability in effort of deter future of Taiwan by other than uh, peaceful means. Uh, any effort of determining future Taiwan other than peaceful means would be of great concern to the United States. So this, this Taiwan Relation Act actually does not oblige U.S. to the defense of Taiwan. It just says U.S. Uh, should help Taiwan with self-defense. What this actually translated to in reality is every, I mean, U.S. sell all these outdated expensive weapons to Taiwan. That basically helps to feed the industrial, uh, military industrial complex back home. Uh, then Taiwan enters the Zhang Jingguo era after the uh, death of Chiang Kai-shek in 1975. Now Zhang Jingguo is a, a, a more enlightened dictator compared his, to his dad. He was sent to study in Soviet Union in 1920s, and that's where he met and married his wife. Uh, in fact, when he was studying in Moscow, he met uh, Deng Xiaoping, and two became close friends. Um, so what, what Zhang when KMT came to Taiwan, they started land reform, uh, which they couldn't do in mainland China because back, back in mainland China, KMT's support base is a landlord class. But on Taiwan, the KMT support base is the KMT army and they're not obligated to the Taiwan land owning class. So they actually carry out land reform. And under Jiang Qingguo's rule, Taiwan started to take off economically. And toward the end of his rule in 1987, Jiang Qingguo finally lifted end the martial law, ending the white terror era of Taiwan. So before 1987, it's illegal to form any political party on Taiwan. You know, only only legal political party is a KMT. Um, So that was ended in 1987 and all the censorship were were relaxed. Uh, But Zhang Jingguo died the following year in 1988 and that paved way for the Taiwan democratization process. Now, Zhang Jingguo also recognized that uh, there's no hope for KMT to take back mainland China, that in order to stay in Taiwan long term, he need to incorporate uh, the, the locals, the, the, the Taiwan locals into his administration. So he promoted a whole bunch of Taiwan locals into the KMT ranks. And one of them is uh, his successor, uh, uh, Li Denghui. And so both Li Denghui and the current Taiwan leader Tsai Ing-wen were the, the Taiwan locals who joined the KMT administration. And uh, under Li Denghui, uh, it, uh, uh, finally uh, an election was held in 1996. Now, keep in mind the democratization of Taiwan almost happened simultaneously with the democratization process happening in South Korea and both being uh, basically US backed uh, right wing military dictatorship. Uh, there's a reason for that because in the late 80s, early 90s, that's the ending, winding down of the, the, the Cold War. U.S. can no longer justify supporting right-wing dictatorship. Well, and not that with a straight face. You know, U.S. still do that, but it's, it's increasingly harder to justify. So uh, the democratization process on 
on Taiwan and South Korea actually confer an extra level of legitimacy to to the continued support of U.S. to these uh, to these uh, to these 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 governments. And uh, next thing, in 1992, the the representative from mainland China and Taiwan actually met in Hong Kong, and this became the basis of what's so-called 92 consensus. So 92 consensus says there's only one China. Uh, but from Taiwan side, they, they, they take it to mean there's one China, but different interpretations, whether that China is People's Republic of China or Republic of China, that is open to interpretation. Uh, on the mainland side, their interpretation is there's only one China. And in fact, the Xi Jinping and Ma Yinjiu met in Singapore in 2015, and Xi Jinping has stated publicly, as long as 1992 consensus and its core values are acknowledged, we stand ready to have contact. Um, so, and, and in, even in 1915, uh, I mean, 2015, Taiwan leader Ma Yinjiu still affirmed uh, the, nine, the adherence to 1992 consensus, which is there's only one China. Okay, now <laughs> the fun part, the, the most recent uh, hype tension in the media about the Chinese aggression. So I took a, a screenshot from the John Oliver video of, of showing the, the PLA aircraft intruding over Taiwan's ADIA zone. So I'm surprised I actually pictured the Taiwan ADIA zone to show you how ridiculous it is. Half of it is over mainland China. And the second fall, they actually mapped out the PLA air aircraft flight path this is pink line right here. As you can see, it's as far as Taiwan Island itself as possible. I mean, it, it, you can argue this is still closer to mainland Chinese coast than it's to Taiwan. And the, certainly, the, this area is international airspace. Taiwan has no jurisdiction over this. Uh, you know, at best, what China is doing is uh, what... Uh, what uh, <laughs> is the equivalent of U.S. Uh, freedom of navigation patrol? This will be the Chinese equivalent of the flight of uh, freedom of flight nav uh, flight f flight uh, freedom. <laughs> uh, sorry, too much acronym. Uh, uh, I so I actually saw. Um, I followed the, the, the Twitter of uh, Taiwan Defense Ministry. They actually tweeted out, you know, on daily basis of, of flight paths of PLA aircraft. So this happened on November 17. So, so ye either yesterday or a couple of days ago, depending on your time zone. And you can see this is the actual flight path of the PLA aircraft. This little red arrow right here, it's so far from Taiwan. I mean, so why? Um, and Xi Jinping uh, gave a speech uh, recently during the um, hundred year anniversary of 1911 uh, the Chinese Revolution. He actually said, "Okay, so I took I went to YouTube and I took the Guardian. Uh, I went to the Guardian channel to take the Guardian translation because you guys are not going to believe me if I take the Chinese state media version." So according to the Guardian translation of the Xi Jinping speech, uh, you can still find it on YouTube, just type Xi Jinping uh, Taiwan speech. Uh, and this Xi Jinping said this, Re reunification through a peaceful manner is the most in line with the overall interest of the Chinese nation, including Taiwan compatriots. And of course this got spin in the Western media to uh, Xi Jinping reiterate the pledge to swallow up Taiwan. So why hype up the tensions? Well, uh, for on the side of Taiwan, for the Taiwan politicians, the fear mongering actually win votes. Uh, the current Taiwan leader Tsai Ing-wen's approval rating was in the single digits before the, her last re-election. The fear mongering about the PRC during the Hong Kong protest actually helped her to win the election. So any hyping the the cross the street tensions will help her party to win elections. Um, this uh, this is. Uh, if, if, if anybody still pretend Taiwan is not an appendage of the U.S. empire, here's uh, Tsai Ing-wen's congratulation uh, tweet to uh, Donald Trump on his uh, <laughs> presidency. Democracy is what ties Taiwan and U.S. together. Look forward to advance our friendship and partnership. Congratulations, Donald Trump. And then uh, in, in 2020, uh, during the, 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 our latest election, there was a pa widespread panic in Taiwan because a lot of the people... A lot of these uh, <laughs> separatists, they were so pro-Trump. They, they went all in on Trump. There was a panic 
among the pro-Trump citizens when Trump lost the election on Taiwan. This is an article from Newsweek on November. Uh, on Taiwan president urged calm as pro-Trump citizen panic amid Biden vote surges. So yeah, okay. Uh, now, why, why the reason for US to hype up tension? The US national uh, security establishment um, US, tension, US China tension is used for justify near trillion dollar defense budget. I know we're not exactly trillion dollars yet, but it's their goal to get there. Uh, you know, we get this ridiculous headline like the Coast Guard is vital to defend Taiwan against China. They're not talking about Taiwan Coast Guard. They're talking about U.S. Coast Guard. OK, so the, the griff is so ridiculous that that's so transparent. And again, you know, U.S. spent 13 billion dollars to, to build the USS Ford aircraft carrier and U.S. is planned. Sorry, I used my own tweet. <laughs> and uh, US is planning to build 10 of these, right? And, and you know, what healthcare? <laughs> they don't care about healthcare. 